excited to start a new series that we're going to be on for several weeks, uh, certainly up to Easter and then beyond that, because Easter is just two weeks from today. Let's pray it don't snow. I mean, it's, only, it's two weeks away, but extended forecast is one to three inches. I'm like, no, not going to happen, and Jesus, not going to happen, but, but then we'll, we'll continue this series after Easter, but, you know, I haven't, I haven't been in the pulpit as much as normal in the last six weeks. I've had a... a a communion service, and then I preached one time, but we had Pastor Mike Popenhagen, new board member, on my birthday, the 18th of February, and then Pastor John David was in the, the pulpit, and then, like I said, communion, then Pastor John Perminsky last week, and I just love having those men in our pulpit, and, uh, but it's nice to be back up here, and whenever I start a new service or a new series, I think I did pretty good last service, but I got, I got all these thoughts downloaded in my, my brain, so help me. Just pray for me that I stay on track because, you know, I, I get off on those little bunny trails sometimes. Sometimes they're good. Sometimes they're just, what was he thinking? So just help me because I got all these thoughts. But, but I want to start a series, and it's about someone mentioned in the Bible quite a bit. We sang a little bit about it today, and that's King David. The word of Jesse, of course, where David further had children and sons and sons, and came the Christ through that lineage, the seed. See, I believe everything God did in the Old Testament was to preserve that seed, I do. See, some people say, well, I don't like the God of the Old Testament. He's mean, he's killing people all the time. Well, listen, the God of the Old Testament and the God of the New Testament are the same God, but because it's a different covenant, under the law, because man fell, and because the seed, somebody say the seed, seed. had not come yet, we were under a covenant that could only cover sin. And when there was a death, there had to be another death so there could be a resurrection. And, and it's unfortunate. People say, well, you know, why did the flood come? Why did God judge Sodom and Gomorrah? Why did God judge this? Why did God do that? To preserve a godly seed. Because God has always had the seed in mind to deliver us. And if we, as Jewish people and others who would come into that, would know that it was pointing towards something that was to come, then they would be covered from their sin under that old covenant until the new covenant came, which is better, the Bible says. If there wouldn't have been a need for it, it never would have happened. Read the book of Hebrews. It's good. And so the new covenant, which embraces the old covenant, but it's even better because it's built on those promises that have now been fulfilled. There, I got that. That was short, a little bit out of the way. So David. David is the shepherd boy who became a warrior king. And even if you're not a Christian, maybe you're watching online, maybe you're here, you've probably seen movies about David. You've heard about David and Bathsheba. Well, we're going to talk about that this morning a little bit. But we made movies about it. You know, most people know who David is. And David is most popular for slaying Goliath, the giant. We'll read a little bit of that story today, and certainly we're going to focus on his victories. But I really felt as we started this today not only to reflect on some of his victories, and we will more in the future, but really to look at the fact that David was a man after God's own heart, even in the victories, but also in the losses. Also, when he messed up really bad, because here's the thing I like about David, is he's just like you and me, Jake. He messes up. <laughs> but the thing is, the Bible says about David that he's a man after God's own heart. Right. Jake, Jake messes up more than I do, but... <laughs> You know that's not true. <laughs> Say, Pastor, you just messed up there. You're messing now. Okay, I'll stop messing. I'm going to get in trouble. But it says he's a man after God's own heart. He continued to look towards God. And let me encourage you this morning, when you fall, when you stumble, when you fail, and you will, sometimes miserably, don't try to do it on purpose because that just isn't smart. But when you fail, get back on track. Be a man or a woman after God's own heart. Seek him in the good times, the bad times. And that's, that's what we see about David. But the thing about David is he did some numbskull things. <coughs> numbskull. You don't hear that term too much anymore, but numb skull. You figure it out. All right. Like and, you know, and he did. And we're going to look a little bit at that today. But it says in 1 Samuel 17, David comes, he says to Saul, your servant used to keep his father's sheep, and when a lion or a bear came and took a lamb out of the flock, 
I went out after it, struck it, delivered the lamb from its mouth. And when it arose against me, I caught it by its beard, I struck it, and I killed it. Your servant was, has killed both the lion and the bear, and this uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them, seeing he has defiled the armies of the living God. Moreover, David said, the Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion, the paw of the bear, he will deliver me from the hand of this Philistine. And Saul said to David, go, and the Lord be with you. Of course, he's about ready to face Goliath, the enemy of the Israelis, the Jewish people. And he reflects on the fact that God had taught him while he was shepherding his father's herds. Yeah. I think you call them herds, sheep, herd, yeah, shepherd, there we go. Flock, but they're still herds. He's a shepherd. Okay, flock. Okay, the first service, they were a lot nicer than you guys. All right. You know, I said first service, listen, I may not be the smartest person in this room. As a matter of fact, I know I'm not. But that's what makes me smart, is I know it and you don't. All right? Because I know. But for some reason, God chose me, so herds, flocks, shepherd. He's not a shep flock. He's a shepherd. All right. Anyway. Got to have fun with me. I make up words sometimes, too. Stay with me. It'll probably happen. It's one of those days. Oh, you must pull it out of me, Wes. It's got to be you. But anyway. <laughs> but see, here's the thing I see about David, at least what I believe to be true, is David understood covenant. His father, Jesse, had raised him and his brothers under that old covenant they knew what it was all about. And so I believe David made a covenant, not only with God, but with his father, that he would keep his father's sheep. It was the covenant he made, and he took care of them. And because he was a covenant keeper, when the lion and the bear came, he killed them to keep the covenant that God had entrusted with him. And I believe when he faced Goliath, because he knew that God was the ultimate covenant keeper. Come on, somebody. He knew that this Philistine is going to be no different. That God will keep his covenant with me when I face this giant and he will fall. Hallelujah. And let me just say this. Every person born was made for battle. Right. Now, may, maybe not physically. You know, some of us are in the military forces. I just want, can I just ask anybody in the room in the military or have a, a family member in the military? Anybody? Can we lift our hands up? I see those hands. Thank you so much for serving. Thank you. Thank you so much. And we're not all called to that. I believe that takes a special person, but we're all warriors. We all have a battle to fight. And, and I believe that if we don't know that we have a battle to fight, in fact, we're in a war. If we don't know that, we're already behind the game. So we have to realize that we have an enemy that's greater than a Philistine giant. He's called the devil. And it's a spiritual battle, but we've been given gifts to beat the enemy, because Jesus has defeated him once and for all. And now we're to go and take authority throughout the earth, preach the gospel. That's what Jesus told us to do. The truth is, on the battlefield, we find that we're in. It could be frustration. There can be failure. Listen, and sometimes we forget who we are. This happened to David. Sometimes we forget. Sometimes you might be in the midst of, of a spiritual battle, and you forget who you are. You forget whose you are. I've been there. I talked briefly last week. I wanted to quit. Don't show your hands. Well, how many ever wanted to quit? Come on. Don't quit. I said don't show your hands. All right. <laughs> we'll talk later. But, but, you know, we all are tempted to quit. Maybe you haven't. Want to give up. And that's really what this message is about. Don't quit. Don't give up. Don't allow yourself to fail in the battles and the war that we face. And so David became this great warrior. First Samuel 18, it says, the young women sang, they danced, and they said, Saul has slain his thousands, and David his tens of thousands. He had quite the reputation, continued to be promoted, and finally the king of all of Israel. And the battle, even though it's not physical, as I mentioned, that's around us is a battle for our families, our spouses, our schools. Oh, my goodness, schools. What is going on in our schools? 
As parents, we need to take a stand. We need to take a stand. Whatever that looks like. We're in an election year and, you know, coming into summer and into fall. I'll never tell you who to vote for, but I will tell you to vote the Bible. I will tell you to vote morals. I will tell you to pray and to vote for life because God's all about life. Whatever that means to you, I don't have to tell you. We could disagree, but God is a life giver, not a life taker. And I, t- I truly believe it doesn't matter. The choices we've got this year, whew, I hope you aren't trusting a man because it, 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 it ain't nobody getting that by himself. But I believe God is in full authority, and I believe when his people pray, and when they respond, and when we vote, because we still have that right for now. But we're in a battle for our public libraries. We're in a battle at the workplace. We're in a battle everywhere we go. You're in a battle when you're at the checkout line for those doggone magazines they put. They, do they, maybe, maybe they'll get you kicked out of the store, but I, whatever. I don't... You stand in line, they got one of them magazines out there, just take it, flip it the other way, and put it back in. <laughs> Keep on shopping. Say in Jesus' name. Come on. Come on. <laughs> Say, Pastor, how about just looking at it? I just put it back backwards. That's all, I put it back backwards. It's an honest, <laughs> honest mistake. But the performance that you and I have in the battle determines our greatness. God forges greatness in us in the battle. But see, David, even though he was a great warrior, he got to a place where he allowed himself to slip just a little. It says this in 2 Samuel 11. So it happened in the spring of the year at the time when kings go out to battle that David sent Joab and his servants with him and all Israel, and they destroyed the people of Ammon and besieged Rabbah, but David remained in Jerusalem. This particular day, David slides out of bed, goes for a stroll on the rooftop, and it wasn't by mistake. He knew who this woman was that was out bathing on her roof. In fact, he knew what time of day it was. It was the wife of one of his faithful soldiers. And he went out and he saw her naked, bathing. And something happened that's a great tragedy in David's life. And I believe this tragedy marks the beginning of the end of David's reign, really. Even though God would be faithful to his covenant and be faithful to the seed. Somebody say the seed. seed. That's Jesus, the the root of Jesse. God was faithful to that. David had problems in his house from here forward. Because he was on the rooftop. You don't want to be on the rooftop when you're supposed to be in the battle. Verse 2. It happened one evening that David arose from his bed and walked on the roof of the king's house. And from the roof he saw a woman bathing. She was very beautiful. David sent and inquired about the woman, and someone said, Is that not Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam, the wife of Uriah the Hittite? Then David sent messengers and took her. She came to him. He lay with her. She was cleansed from her impurity. She returned to her house, and the woman conceived. So she sent and she told David and said, I am with child. And so the story doesn't begin with David leering and lusting after another man's wife. It begins in the fact that he made a decision to not go out to battle. Come on. It says in the spring of the year, when kings go out to battle, David was a king. David wasn't old and feeble. It was his responsibility to lead his men. And listen, men and women, you lead your families. You say, well, I'm single. Then lead yourself. You say, well, I'm, you know, I don't own my own business. I have no authority Well, you lead at the place you work. I know people say they get frustrated. I'm the only Christian in the job that I have. I'm the only one there. Well, then lead. See, God needs to get me out of here, perhaps. But lead in the process. Lead where you are. Don't forget. Don't allow your mind to get on the rooftop somewhere. There's a battle. I already said our nation depends on it. The people who are born and die every day depend on it. It's time for the body of Christ to rise up. Say, well, I'm not an evangelist. No, but you cannot evangelize in every place you go. Every marketplace, every restaurant. We can evangelize. We can pray and take it serious. 
and we need to. David should have been at battle. He stayed home. Don't let that happen to you. So Bathsheba becomes pregnant. David discovers it. He panics. He thinks, okay, what am I going to do now? Oh, let's read about it, because his plan goes from bad to worse. These are some of the worst decisions David has ever made. Let's learn from it. 2 Samuel 11, then David said to Joab, he said, send me Uriah the Hittite, and Joab sent Uriah to David. When Uriah had come to him, David asked how Joab was doing and how the people were doing and how the war prospered. And David said, Uriah, go down to your house and wash your feet. So Uriah departed from the king's house, and a gift of food from the king followed him. Followed him. See, David had hopes that Uriah would go down there, enjoy the gifts of food, leisure with his wife. In the comfort of her arms, they would sleep together and cover up David's sin. That's what David hoped for. That's what he thought. But you know, there was one problem with that whole idea. David had forgotten who he was, but Uriah hadn't. He didn't go home. Oh, the gifts went to the house. He slept at the palace doors. He stayed there on guard. On guard. So when David awoke in the morning, he saw that Uriah was still there. He's like, what's up? Well, Uriah answers with a question. Let's look at this. Verse 11. Uriah said to David, the ark in Israel and Judah are dwelling in tents of my Lord Joab and the servants of my Lord are encamped in the open fields. Shall I then go to my house to eat and drink and to lie with my wife? As you live and as your soul is, I will not do this thing. I don't know for sure, but I can imagine David probably turned about as white as a ghost. Faced with the fact that he had not only committed adultery with another man's wife, but faced with the fact that he had a man who was serving him that was a better warrior at that moment than David was. He had forgotten who he was. He had forgotten who he was. 2 Timothy 2, it says this, no one engaged in warfare entangles himself with the affairs of this life that he may please him who enlisted him as a soldier. And also, if anyone competes in athletics, he is not crowned unless he competes according to the rules. Don't become entangled. Lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, pride of life. It's okay to have some pursuits in life. And listen, it's okay if you choose to go home and have a nice fat steak today for dinner. Unless you're a vegetarian, I don't understand that. <laughs> but my vegetarian, hey, you know, somebody said, you know, <laughs> that cattle ate grass. I ate the cattle, therefore I'm a vegetarian, all right. Come on, come on, come on. So, I mean, it's okay to have a good salad. I like salad, but don't take my meat. And if you don't like meat, that's fine, but enjoy but the thing is, when we get entangled, 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 yeah. what does that mean, Pastor? That means when your waking, every waking thought is about the world and not serving God. That's what that means. And you know what? Many Christians live there. Yeah. No different than the world. Oh, I'm, I love Jesus. Okay. No, I think so many Christians, I've said this before and I'll keep saying it till my dying day. Many Christians love the fact that Jesus loves them and they're not going to hell. If they love Jesus, they would obey him. That's what Jesus said. Yeah, that's right. And we don't. We don't. We're not in the game. We're not engaged. Well, someone else will do it. Oh. Stand before Jesus, and he said, what did you do with your life? Well, I figured someone else would do it. And Jesus said, well, they did their part. Come on. Mm. Give that to me. I never knew you. And give it to the one who had more. Come on. Real. So David arranges yet one more step in his sinister plot. He says, well, that didn't work. So listen to this, verse 14. In the morning it happened, and David wrote a letter to Joab, sent it to the hand of Uriah, or by the hand of Uriah. He wrote a letter, and he said, Set Uriah in the forefront of the hottest battle and retreat from him that he may be struck down and die. So it was while Job, 
besieged the city that he assigned Uriah to a place where he knew there were valiant men. Then the men of the city came out and fought with Joab. And some of the people of the servants of David fell, and Uriah the Hittite died also. What a plan. But there's something in that verse that I don't want us to miss. Even though Uriah ended up dying in the battle, which is where David belonged, one other thing happened. David lost many other faithful men. Not only did he underestimate the character of Uriah, he underestimated the character of all of his other warriors because they didn't just leave Uriah. They fought to the death. It's almost like first, Uriah sleeps outside the palace door. Second, more men die because they're faithful. I think David, by that point, is about as white as a ghost again. Thinking, what have I done? What have I done? And that's the thing. When we're on the rooftop, we don't make good decisions. It's all about what we want, when we want it. How it serves me. Go and get me that woman. I have to have her now. Samson said that too. Go get me that woman. <laughs> Go get her for me. We live in a consumer, leisure-driven society full of the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life. It's everywhere. Yeah. It's everywhere we turn. It's all about filling ourselves with what we want when we want it. And, you know, I think David thinks, well, you know, Uriah's dead. I'll just marry Bathsheba. Nobody will know the difference. See, you don't think right when you're on the rooftop. Because somebody did know the difference, and it was God. You may hide from people, but you can't hide from God. You can't. Now, God is compassionate. He's kind. He's merciful. But you can't hide from him. Can't just keep hiding things. God knows. He knows where you're at. He knows if you're in the battle or on the rooftop. Don't pretend to be on the battle, but you're in the rooftop. Don't come to church and shout and dance, but then when you get home, you're on the rooftop looking at pornography. Now, we can all stumble, and if you have a, 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 if you have a challenge in that area, we want to help you. I mean, I, we, uh, there's such a problem with that nowadays, worse than ever. But we can't just keep doing the things that we've always done. It's time for us to stop faking it till we make it. If you fake it till you make it, you'll never make it because you're a faker. I hate that term. Fake it till you make it. Oh, please don't. Just be honest and get some help along the way. Come on, somebody. Can we be honest? My goodness. Fake it till you make it. I don't need nobody. Well, yeah, you do. You just don't think you do. You're on the rooftop. You think you're in the battle because you shout louder than everybody else. Oh, man. Mm -mm 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 -mm. Now, I'm going to read quite a number of verses here. You say, Pastor, that's a lot of verses to read. We believe in reading the Bible in this church. There's my answer. Read on in our story, 2 Samuel 12, 1 through 15. Then the Lord sent Nathan to David, and he came to him, and he said to him, there were two men in the city, one rich, the other poor. The rich man had exceedingly many flocks and herds, but the poor man had nothing, except one little ewe lamb, which he had brought and nourished, and it grew up together with him and with his children. It ate of his own food and drank of his own cup, lay in his bosom. It was like a daughter to him. And a traveler came to the rich man who refused to take from his own flock and from his own herd to prepare one for the wayfaring man who had come to him. But he took the poor man's lamb, prepared it for the man who had come to him. So David's anger was greatly aroused against... Uh, remember this verse 5. We're going to talk about it in a minute. Against the man, Nathan said, As the Lord lives, the man... Who has done this thing shall surely die, and he shall restore fourfold. See, part of the position and the office of king was to declare judgment. David's declaring his own judgment. He doesn't even know it. God worked through the prophets, the priests, and the king, the old covenant. Jesus is all those, and now he's anointed us priests and kings with him. He said, because he did this thing, he had no pity. And look what Nathan, Nathan says. You are that man. I was reading this, I think. Now, this may not be an issue you have, but I'm just going to confess my own weakness sometimes. 
I'll be reading a scripture, and I know you've done this, so don't look so holy. <laughs> reading a scripture, and you're like, you know what? Greg needs to learn that. I think I'll text it to him. Did you ever read this, bro? Yeah. <laughs> then you read something else. Oh. Hmm. Yeah, you know, the way Trish has been acting lately, I better send, <laughs> get her off my back. Killing people with the word of God. Yeah. Some of you all this, some of you all, why don't you just you all, you all, in your own house. Come on. Mm. Lord, help us. But I thought, you know, how often do we allow God to say that very thing to us? You are that man. When our Bible reading and our prayer, when God showed us something about ourselves, I'd be like, oh God, oh, have mercy on me. Because when we do, listen, that's called repentance. Turns it around for our good. Now, you don't have to be perfect. I'm not, I'm not saying that. I'll never say that because you're not. Okay? Doesn't mean you can't try. Does that make sense? Yeah. No, no reason to not try. That's something you can practice till perfect. Yeah. You can't fake it till you make it, but you can practice till perfect. Yeah. Well, come on. God's quick to forgive us, but do we let him? Somebody said this, I love it. Don't just read your Bible, let the Bible read you. And don't just say it, do it. Come on. I'll read you on the inside. Ooh. Thus says the Lord God of Israel, I anointed you king over Israel, I delivered you from the hand of Saul. I gave you your master's house and your master's wives into your keep and gave the house of Israel and Judah. And if that had, not, had been too little, I also would have given you much more. Bible says in Romans chapter 8 and other places that Jesus, having given us salvation, will gladly give us all things that pertain to life and godliness. Somebody say more. more. You want to know what kind of God we serve? Somebody say more. more. We serve a God who has more for us. Not less, more. Wow. But don't forget what he's given us. Sometimes we enjoy the blessings of God and forget who gave it to us. We got plenty of problems in this country, but, and I know money's tight for a lot of us, but it's better than a lot of places in the world. That's right. And no matter how hard things get, listen, somebody paid the price for what we enjoy. Come on. And that's true. You say, oh, we got a lot of problems. Then, then move to Canada. <laughs> Bye. I love it when these, these entertainers say, if so-and-so gets elected, I'm moving. I'm like, please. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Then they don't move. They still make idiots out of themselves on talk shows. If you're watching that stuff, turn it off. The Lord says, you are that man. Okay. Where was I? Uh, Why have you despised the commandment of the Lord to do evil in his sight? You've killed your right Hittite with the sword. You've taken his wife to be your wife. You killed him with the sword, the people of Amon. Now, therefore, the sword shall never depart from you. You see that. Because you've despised me and have taken the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be your wife. Thus says the Lord, behold, I will raise up adversity against you in your own house. And I will take your wives before your eyes and give them to your neighbor. Maybe you've read it before. His own son Absalom sleeps with one of his concubines on the rooftop in broad daylight. Fulfills this prophecy right here, this judgment. David says, I've sinned, and Nathan said to David, the Lord also has put away your sin. You shall not die. However, because of this deed, has given great occasion to the enemies of the Lord to blaspheme. The child also is born, so surely die. Then Nathan departed to his house, and the Lord struck the child that Uriah's wife bore to David and became ill. Now listen, I want to say this here real quickly. Every bad thing that happens in your life is not the judgment of God. All right? This, this is the old covenant. Same God, different covenant. Again, God was always preserving the seed, always preserving the seed. And there were things that had to happen. Some people may not like that answer, but that's it. But everybody can receive Jesus. Yes. Old covenant, new covenant. So if something bad has happened to you, don't, let, don't you let, I, I, I love it, I hate it. When Christian, somebody's sick and a Christian says, well, brother, where did you let the devil in? Oh, shut up. Wait, just now, when you opened your mouth and asked me where I let the devil in. 
Now, I understand there's a little bit of truth in that. Don't, don't let the devil. We're talking about it today. Get in the battle. Don't live on the rooftop. That's how you don't let the devil in. And you might still get sick. You might still get a bad report. Something bad may still happen to your family. But pastor, name it and claim it. Well, bad things happen to good people. The rain falls on the just and the unjust, whether you like it or not. That's right. And some things in life just suck. <laughs> I already told you, there's smarter people in this room, but for some reason God put me up here. So, there's hope for you. So. <laughs> but boy, if you look at this in our story, the baby dies... Amnon, one of David's sons, sleeps with his half-sister. I mean, can you get any sicker than that? Absalom finds out, kills Amnon. Absalom dies. He's trying to tear the kingdom apart and steal the kingdom from his father. Another one of David's sons, Adonijah, dies fourfold. Fourfold. All right. Now, you may be sitting here today and you say... Why did David decide not to go to battle on that day? I'm glad you asked. Because in the next seven minutes, that's what it says. Well, Pastor John went late last week, so in the next ten minutes. Right? No. I'm going to tell you three lies of retreat. Three lies of retreat. Take this home with you. Lie number one, you've earned the right to retire. Yeah. And listen... Our culture, here, here's, let me just say this. Investing, 401k, 403b, that's what you do if you're in a religious occupation organization, it's the same kind of thing. But Stocks, maybe you got money and properties and you rent them out and keep them, passive income. There's nothing wrong with passive income. Manage your money well. But it's a mind shift, okay? Nowhere in Scripture is there retirement. That is a Western culture thing. I'm going to retire from what? And here's what, here's what we think. We think retirement. I've, I'll never forget my twin brother, Rick. He's made a lot of money over the years. I remember in his 30s, he said to me, I'm going to retire early. I said, when? He said, oh, probably 45, or like 31 or so. We're both 65. He's still working. <laughs> He's doing good, but. And they say more and more people work longer and now, yeah, because it costs more to retire. <laughs> and even if you're able to do that, you don't just check out of your assignment. Say, well, I work my, three, my seven to three job. I work my nine to five job. Well, if you're working a seven to three job, a nine to five job, or an all night job, why don't you prepare for that job that God's going to take you to when you don't do that job any longer? Instead of working, it's, we think, well, you know, what's retirement? Oh, I'll go sit down in Florida. I'm going to sip on one of them umbrella cocktails. <laughs> okay. But be careful what's in it and don't drink too many of them because that's stupid. Come on. And then what are you going to do all afternoon? Oh, I'm going to play pickleball. <laughs> well, Okay. <laughs> Problem with playing pickleball all day long is you're in a pickle and you don't know it. You're on the rooftop. You're on the rooftop. So we have this idea that, well, I made it. That's what David thought. Think, well, once I land that big job, I'll have it made in the shade, pay off all my debts, invest my money, and I'll travel the world. Now travel, please. But listen, if we live our lives like that and we don't consider the fact that nowhere in Scripture does God say, okay, you're, you're done. No. What you see in Scripture is men and women of God. You see, you see men serving in the temple. You see women praying in the temple. In the Old, Old Covenant. Yeah. The Apostle John, the only apostle that wasn't killed, although they tried, all the other ones were beheaded or crucified in some way. They tried to kill him, but didn't work. He lived to be ripe old age in Ephesus, involved in Timothy's church. Come on now. 
So we have this mentality. We gotta, we gotta shift our mind. As I'm gonna tell you, there are families that need parents, grandparents, because their families are fractured. Say, well, I never had any kids, and I understand some of us could be in that situation, or maybe something tragic happened, you lost a child or whatever. There are children that need you. There are families that need you. The body of Christ needs you. A world going to hell needs you. Can't imagine standing before God. Well, that's someone else's. Somebody else did it. What? They did their part. What's your part? How are you actively involved giving in church? Financially, even when it hurts. Everybody smile. See, nobody can smile quite like me because the mustache is coming back. All right. Wait till it gets out here that really smiles. Get involved in ministry. Take Jesus to the workplace with you, the marketplace. So I didn't lead anybody to Christ today. Listen, you may not pray with somebody, but if you're fully equipped and you're ready to lead someone, you lead them to Christ whether you know it or not. With a look, with a word, with a kind gesture. Perhaps you'll have a chance to pray. So ask for those opportunities. But don't think, well, I didn't get a chance today. Oh, they saw Jesus. I've been places I can tell people just squirm. It's the presence of God on you. They don't even know why. And you just smile anyway. Love you. They expect you to get all mad and stuff. I mean, people say that, and I say, oh, I'm fine. They say, I know that about you if it's a place I've gone to. I'll just wait. You know, here's what gets me. You go somewhere, and they're training a cashier. You can tell they're new, but you're in a hurry, and you're making the trainer's job harder and the new employees harder. Oh, my gosh, what happened to you? Say, so, oh, wait, I'm fine. I ain't in a hurry. Why are we in a hurry? Well, I got to be on time. I, look, we should be on time. But most people who run around, I got to be on time, they're late everywhere they go. <laughs> Man, I'm stepping on toes today. <laughs> hey, stay in the game. Stay in the battle. And can I just say this? Maybe you're not approaching retirement. And the truth is, many people can't afford to retire. That's just the reality, financially. It's reality. You're going to do some kind of work. Most people. It doesn't mean not to try. I'm not saying that. But statistics prove otherwise. So, okay, Dave Ramsey's good. Listen to what he says. But some, pe- some people still have to work. Dave's old enough to retire. He's still working. That's right. All right. Learn as much as you can. But you know what gets me? There's people in their 20s and their 30s that haven't even joined the battle yet. And you're on the rooftop. If you're not engaged in the battle, listen, everybody. If you're not engaged in the battle we're in, the spiritual battle, you are on the rooftop by default. You say, well, I didn't make a choice to be on the rooftop. Yes, you did by default. Number two. Lie number two, you can hide premeditated sin. No, you can't. And some people could argue all sin is premeditated sin because you have to make a decision. So I get that. But the bottom line is you don't just get up one day, drive to work and say, today I think I'll have an affair. No, you've been lusting and thinking and worrying about how you don't get honor at home. Well, why don't you try honoring her? She don't need to get your slippers and newspaper when you walk in. <laughs> and put the stupid cell phones down. Amen. Yes, sir. Oh my <laughs> gosh. <laughs> oh. See, the thing is, the devil knows your price. He knows your vulnerability. On the rooftop, you can be defeated, so can I. On the battlefield, though, our enemy is already defeated. See, if you're engaged in a battle, here's the good news. God is fighting with you. By default, when you're on the rooftop, God can't fight with you because you're not engaged. It's time to partner. Get in the battle. On the battlefield, you're a devil killer. 
On the battle, God forges your character. Don't keep living the way you've been living. Take dominion. Look, look at this, Ephesians 6. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God. I got to pause there. I said first service. I think Shannon, I saw you post that this this week. I see you all on post on postbook. I see you all on Facebook. Sometimes I don't like it. Sometimes I don't. Sometimes I just think, what are they thinking? Okay. And so not with you, though. That's not what this is. It's good. She puts on there. I stepped on the scale the other day, and that armor of God is heavy, y'all. I'm like, ha, I like that. I like that. I liked it. I had a friend of mine. This is stupid. This is a, this is a bunny trail, but I have to say it. And I told, I told him it was stupid. His, he, his wife would try something on. Could you imagine this, Angie? Listen. His wife tries on a dress. Does this make me look fat? And he'd say, no, fat makes you look fat. <laughs> Jacob would Jay, Jay be, be sleeping in the hen house the rest of the year. I mean, and I said, brother, don't do that. Don't tell her fat makes her look fat. She knows that, but she don't need your encouragement. Oh, I'll keep going. For we wrestle not with flesh and blood, but against principalities, against the devil, powers, rulers of darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness, heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to to withstand the evil day, having done all to stand, stand. stand yeah. And listen, some people, you know, if you like to go through this, do it. I'm putting on the helmet of salvation. I'm putting on the breastplate of righteousness in your prayer time. I'm taking up the sword of the spirit. I got the, 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 the shield of faith. And, and, oh, and then you go out and live a stupid life. That did you no good. You don't. You don't put it on and look at yourself in the mirror. And <laughs> what you do is you wear it and you use it. And when the devil comes, by faith, you quench it. Use the word of God. Don't just quote it. Use it. Quoting's part of that, but you get it. You know what I'm saying. Lie number three. You can't keep winning. Maybe you've been engaged in the battle and you think, well, I don't know. It's, I've been fighting hard and Sooner or later, you know, everybody gets a loss, and I don't know if I can handle a loss. Whatever's in your mind. I think David may have been thinking he's getting older. And understand, David, he was well-known in battle. He was a mighty warrior. And, I, and all the enemies, the upcoming young soldiers, they wanted his head. It was not a safe place for him to be. And let me just say this. When you're engaged, you get the devil's attention. When you're on the rooftop... You're like, the devil's after me. My refrigerator broke. <laughs> One thing we told our kids growing up, listen, we're going to give you the best spiritual advice we can. Refrigerators break. Cars break. <laughs> washers and dryers break. Garage door openers and, <laughs> yeah, springs break. <laughs> Things break. Could it be the devil? Maybe. Probably not. Probably not. But when you're, when you're engaged in the battle, you could be thinking, man, I just, oh, I don't know if I can take another loss. Because when you're in the battle, you're going to have losses. You're going to get it one way or the other. You might as well be engaged. But don't ever think that you can't keep winning. Fight because it's right. Fight because of your family and the generations that come. Fight because of those who have yet to hear the message of Christ, this depends on us, people. we got to get on board. we got to get in the battle. And finally, 1 Corinthians 9. Everybody stand, please. Stand up if you're able. And everyone who competes for the prize, excuse me, <clears throat> is temperate in all things. Now they do it to obtain a perishable crown, but we for an imperishable crown. Therefore I run thus, not with uncertainty. Thus I fight, not as one who beats the air, but I discipline my body and bring it into subjection, lest when I have preached to others, I myself should become disqualified. Listen, Jesus wants to give us a crown. A crown. Yeah. I can imagine you here, if you're watching online, probably most of us would say, I'd love to hear Jesus say these three words, or four words. Well done. Oh, it's more than that. Five words. <laughs> ah, ah. 
Hey, after leading worship and preaching two services, all right, I'm doing pretty good. Well done, good and faithful servant. Well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of the Lord. It's a crown. But listen, you can't get a crown if you're not engaged. So still standing, every head bowed, every eye closed. Father, thank you for what you've showed us today. Help us to get engaged in the battle, stay engaged in the battle. To draw near you, to learn from you, to be used in every situation by you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. We're so glad you stopped by the website today. We pray the teaching you just listened to impacts you in a way that helps you on your spiritual journey. Please take time to check out the rest of the website. It is full of information about our church, as well as resources to help you in your walk with Christ. If you have not already attended one of our worship services, we hope you make time to visit us in the near future. Everything we do here is designed with you in mind. The Bible says your real life is found in a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. All of our activities point to one thing, our mission statement. Real people living real life with a real God who has the answers.